Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous two videos in this series, we introduced the fixed point iteration and Newton method for solving scalar nonlinear equations. Here we're going to look at generalizing these two techniques to solve systems of nonlinear equations in multiple dimensions. Let's now look at fixed point iterations and Newton's method for systems of nonlinear equations. So we'll look at a function capital F from Rn to Rn, where n is greater than 1, and we'll seek a root alpha in Rn such that f of alpha is equal to 0. And in component form, we can write this out as f1 of alpha equals 0, f2 of alpha equals 0, up to fn of alpha equals 0. And for a fixed point iteration, we want to again rewrite f of x equals 0 in the form x is equal to g of x, and that will then lead to an iteration xk plus 1 is equal to g of xk. And we can establish many of the same properties we had for the scalar case by following through the same convergence proofs but replacing the modulus operator with the norm operator. And suppose now that our function g satisfies a Lipschitz condition with respect to some norm and a Lipschitz constant l where L is strictly less than 1. In that case, G will be a contraction and our fixed point iteration will converge to some fixed point alpha. Recall also that we can define the n by n Jacobian matrix, JG, that has components so that JG at IJ is equal to the partial derivative DGI by DXJ. And if we have that the infinity norm of jg at alpha is less than 1, then there will be some neighborhood of alpha for which the fixed point iteration will converge to alpha. And again, the proof of this is natural extension of the scalar case. Again, we can employ fixed point iterations to solve f of x equals 0. And let's now consider an example where we have the equations x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 1 equals 0 and 5x1 squared plus 21x2 squared minus 9 equals 0. So the first equation represents a unit circle and the second equation represents an ellipse. And we can rearrange these two equations to get that x1 is equal to the square root of 1 minus x2 squared and x2 is equal to the square root of 9 minus 5x1 squared divided by 21. So now let's consider defining the function g, where the first component, g1, is equal to the square root of 1 minus x2 squared, and the second component, g2, is equal to the square root of 9 minus 5x1 squared divided by 21. So we'll now take a look at a Python example to see how the fixed point iteration behaves for this case. And we will see that we indeed have convergence to a solution. Let's now take a look at the program ita underscore 2d.py that demonstrates a two component fixed point iteration for finding a solution to the two equations x1 squared plus x2 squared is equal to one and 5x1 squared plus 21x2 squared is equal to 9. And in this program, we first define a two-component function, f, that we're going to perform root finding on, and the two components correspond to the two equations that we're trying to solve. We'll then define a function called printSol that can print out our solution, and it will take in the two components, x1 and x2. It will also evaluate the components of f for the values of x1 and x2, and it will perform a formatted print command. We'll then define the starting position for our fixed point iteration, and we'll start both x1 and x2 from a zero. We'll then perform the fixed point iteration, and we'll update x1 and x2 according to the formulae that we gave in the slides. We'll then print out our solution components. So let me now go ahead and run this program.
And so we see that our iteration starts from 0, 0. And as we take a number of steps in our iteration, we see that we have convergence to a solution. And actually, the solution for this problem is that x1 is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2, and x2 is equal to a half. And if we look at the corresponding function values, then we see that they converge to zero, indicating that we have indeed found a root. And we can see that every three iterations, we obtain an additional digit of accuracy in the solution, and the exponents decrease by one for every three iterations. So that means that our convergence rate is roughly the cube root of a tenth, which works out to be about 0.46. So while we found a solution, the convergence rate is rather slow. And even after 30 iterations, we still haven't reached numerical precision. And we therefore might like to see if we could come up with different iterative approaches that could converge to our solution at a faster rate. As in the one-dimensional case, Newton's method is generally more useful than the standard fixed-point iteration. And the natural generalization of Newton's method is xk plus 1 is equal to xk minus the inverse of the Jacobian of f at xk multiplied by f of xk. And we can write this in the standard form where we solve a sequence of linear systems, j f of xk times delta xk is equal to minus f of xk, and here, delta xk is equal to xk plus 1 minus xk. And once again, if x0 is sufficiently close to alpha, then Newton's method will converge quadratically. And we'll take a look at the reason for this now. And this result, again, will follow from Taylor's theorem. And we'll therefore first consider how to generalize the familiar one-dimensional Taylor's theorem to the n-dimensional case. And we'll begin by taking a look at a function f from rn to r. And let's now define a scalar function phi of s, which is equal to f of x plus s times delta. So we see here that phi of 0 would evaluate f at a position x, and as we vary s, then we will evaluate our function f along a direction given by a vector delta. And we can now write down the Taylor's theorem for this scalar function, phi. And we'll see here that phi at 1 is equal to phi of 0 plus the sum from L equal 1 to k of the lth derivative of phi evaluated at 0 divided by L factorial plus the k plus 1 th derivative of phi evaluated at a point eta, where eta is between 0 and 1. And we can also see that phi of 0 is equal to f of x, phi of 1 is equal to f of x plus delta, and we can evaluate phi prime of 0 by making use of the chain rule. And we'll see here that when we use the chain rule, we'll get all of the partial derivatives of f with respect to the different components xj. We can do a similar thing to evaluate the second derivative of phi, and we'll see here that we'll get all of the second partial derivative combinations of f, and we could continue in this fashion to higher derivatives of phi. Hence, we'll write that f of x plus delta is equal to f of x plus the sum from l equal 1 to k of ul of x divided by l factorial plus ek, and we'll define ul of x to be d by dx1 times delta 1 plus d by dx2 times delta 2 up to d by dxn times delta n, all raised to the lth power, applied to f, evaluated at x. And we'll define our error ek to be uk plus 1 evaluated x plus eta delta divided by k plus 1 factorial. And here, eta is a value between 0 and 1. And we might be interested in being able to bound the size of this error term, ek. And to do this, 
Let's introduce that a is an upper bound on the absolute values of all of the derivatives of order k plus 1 of f. Then we could write down that the magnitude of ek is less than or equal to 1 divided by k plus 1 factorial multiplied by our expression for u k plus 1. But now we can replace all of the components of delta with an upper bound given by the infinity norm of the delta vector. And we can then pull this infinity norm of delta outside of this expression and we'll be left with that this is equal to the infinity norm of delta to the k plus 1 power divided by k plus 1 factorial times the magnitude of d by dx1 plus d by dx2 up to d by dxn, all raised to the k plus 1th power, applied to f. And we can bound each term in this expression with a, and there will be n to the k plus 1 terms in total, and therefore we can write that the magnitude of ek is going to be less than or equal to n to the k plus 1 divided by k plus 1 factorial multiplied by a multiplied by the infinity norm of delta raised to the k plus 1 power. For our analysis of Newton's method, we'll only require the Taylor expansion up to first order. And therefore, we can write down that f of x plus delta is equal to f of x plus the gradient of f transpose multiplied by delta plus e1. If we now want to calculate a Taylor expansion for a function f from rn to rn, then we can apply our previous Taylor expansion to each component fi of f. And therefore we can write down that fi of x plus delta is equal to fi of x plus the gradient of fi transpose times delta plus an error term ei1. And we can combine all of these expressions together to write down that f of x plus delta is equal to f of x plus the Jacobian of f times delta, plus an error term ef. And we can bound the infinity norm of ef by the maximum over all components i of the magnitudes of ei1. And using our previous expression, we can bound this by n squared over 2 times the maximum of magnitudes of all second partial derivatives of f, multiplied by the infinity norm of delta squared. So now let's return to Newton's method. We have that 0 is equal to f of alpha, and that is equal to f of xk plus the Jacobian of f at xk multiplied by alpha minus xk plus ef. And we can rewrite this to get that xk minus alpha is equal to j of xk inverse times f of xk plus j f of xk inverse times ef. And the Newton iteration itself can be rewritten as j f of xk times xk plus 1 minus alpha is equal to j f of xk times xk minus alpha minus f of xk. And by combining these two expressions, we can obtain that xk plus 1 minus alpha is equal to j f of xk inverse times ef. And now let's consider taking infinity norms of both sides of this equation. And we can now use our bound for the infinity norm of ef. And we'll get a number of terms that are constant, but we'll get one term in this bound that is proportional to the infinity norm of xk minus alpha squared. And therefore, we can conclude that the infinity norm of xk plus 1 minus alpha is less than or equal to a constant times the infinity norm of xk minus alpha squared. And therefore, we've established quadratic convergence just as we had with the scalar case for Newton's method. Let's now look at an example of applying Newton's method to derive the two-point gauss quadrat rule. And in the introduction to this unit, we discussed that this could be viewed as an interesting nonlinear root-finding problem. 
And in the two-point Gauss quadrature rule, we have quadrature points x1 and x2 and associated weights w1 and w2. And we know that this quadrature rule should integrate polynomials up to degree 3 exactly. So if we consider each of the monomials 1x, x squared and x cubed, and we demand that our quadrature rule can integrate each of these exactly, then we'll get four nonlinear equations that the xi and the wi need to satisfy. And we could find a solution to these four equations by introducing a function f from r4 to r4 with components f1, f2, f3, and f4 that are shown here. And we could solve this in Python, making use of our own implementation of the Newton method. And to do this, we'll require the Jacobian of f, and that is calculated and shown here. Alternatively, we could make use of Python's f-solve routine, which can perform root finding on multidimensional functions such as our four-component f that we're considering. And the f-solve routine performs the hybrid Powell method, which is a variation on Newton's method that still has the rapid convergence properties of Newton, but incorporates some modifications that can improve robustness in some cases. And internally, fSolve makes use of Fortran's MinPack library. And depending on the arguments that are passed to fSolve, it will call two different routines within MinPack. If we call fSolve just with our function, then it will call the routine within MinPack called HYBRD. And this will perform the hybrid PAL method, and it will use finite differences to estimate the Jacobian of our function. Alternatively, we could call fSolve with the function and its analytical derivative, and in this case, it will make use of the hybrj function within MinPack, and this will use this analytical Jacobian information without the need for finite differences. So let's now take a look at a few Python examples that can compare our own implementation of Newton's method to fSolve with and without the analytical Jacobian. Let's now look at the program gq underscore solve.py that finds the two-point Gauss quadrature scheme using several different nonlinear root finding methods. And in this program, we first define a variable called mode that chooses the method that we're going to use. And if mode equals zero, then we'll make use of a custom implementation of the Newton method. If mode equals one, then we'll make use of SciPy's fSolve routine with an analytical Jacobian. And if mode equals two, then we'll make use of fSolve but without the Jacobian. We'll then define the function that we're going to perform root finding on. And this will take in a four component vector x. And we'll first unpack x into x1 and x2 our quadrature points, and w1 and w2 are associated quadrature weights. And we know that our two-point Gauss quadrature rule has to integrate polynomials up to degree 3 exactly. And therefore, if we consider the monomials 1, x, x squared, and x cubed, then if we want our quadrature scheme to integrate these exactly, then each of these will give us a nonlinear constraint that our xi and wi need to satisfy. And we'll pass back these constraints in the components of our function f. We'll then define an analytical Jacobian. And following the standard nomenclature for SciPy's fSolve routine, we'll call this f prime. And f prime will calculate and return back a 4x4 matrix. And those components were previously given in the slides. We'll then define initial condition for our three different methods. And we'll make use of the same initial condition for all three approaches. If mode equals 0, then we'll perform our custom Newton method. And each step in the Newton method, we need to solve a linear system involving the analytical Jacobian. And each step in the iteration will evaluate the Euclidean norm of f 
and once this falls below a tolerance of 10 to the minus 14 then we'll terminate the iteration. If mode equals 1 then we'll call fsolve and we'll pass in the additional argument of f prime equals f prime to supply the analytical Jacobian. If mode equals 2 then we'll call fsolve but without that Jacobian. And for all three methods, we'll finish by printing the solution. It's also worth noting that our functions f and f prime contain print statements. Our function f will print out the current solution, and our function f prime will print out a message to indicate that it's been called. So now let me go ahead and run this program, and I'm first going to look at the case of the custom Newton method. And we see that we have rapid convergence to our expected solution. And this would be expected since we know that the Newton method has quadratic convergence and tends to find a solution after only a few steps. We see that each step we made a call to f prime and a call to f. And this is expected if we look at the Newton iteration step here. Overall we see that we required six calls to f and five calls to f prime and the reason that we have one additional call to f is because on the final step of the method we calculate f and determine that its norm is below the tolerance and then terminate and we don't have to calculate f prime in that case. So now let's compare these results to the fsolve routine. So we'll first call fsolve but we'll make use of the analytical Jacobian. So again we have rapid convergence to a solution. And we can see that the Jacobian was actually only called twice by this routine. And in fsolve, it specifically tries to minimize the number of calls to the Jacobian, because these are typically rather expensive. And it tries to reuse the information in the Jacobian to make several steps. Now let's compare these results to fsolve without the Jacobian. So in this case we see that there were a number of additional calls to f and this is because our fsolve routine is trying to estimate the Jacobian using finer differences. And at first glance, it may appear that it calls our function f for three identical values of xi and wi. However, in reality, these additional calls had slight perturbations to the xi and wi. And one of the difficulties with devising a completely general root finding routine is that it has no way a priori to know the appropriate scales of the problem and therefore choose the appropriate size for making a finite difference calculation. And therefore, based on these initial calls, the fsolve routine will determine the appropriate size to use. And after these initial calls, then we see that it makes use of a slightly larger size of step in order to calculate our estimate of the Jacobian. We see again that we have convergence to the expected solution. So we could now compare the work done by these three different approaches. And in this table, I've summarized the calls that were made to F 
and to JF by the three different approaches. And we see that the custom Newton routine makes use of the fewest calls to F. However, it makes use of the largest number of calls to JF. At the other end of the spectrum, F solved without the Jacobian makes use of more calls to F and zero calls to JF. So we might ask which one of these is more efficient. And usually the calls to JF are more expensive. If we look at the current code, then our Jacobian contains 16 terms, whereas F contains only four. So therefore we might expect that the Jacobian is four times as expensive as calling F. And by that metric, we would see that F solve without the Jacobian is actually the most efficient technique. However, in reality, we might find that the terms in the Jacobian involve many common factors or terms that are simple to evaluate. And we see, for example, that we have several zeros and ones that are very easy to evaluate. So we may have that JF is not a factor of four more expensive in terms of computation. And in that case, one of the other approaches, such as f solve with a Jacobian or the custom Newton method, might be more efficient overall.